Hello, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Account and Coca Report. Our guest today is David Cayley, a writer and broadcaster based in Toronto, Canada. Mr. Cayley has had an illustrious career conducting radio programs and interviews focused on the philosophies of major contemporary thinkers and on the history of intellectual thought. For 30 years, he made radio commentaries for the acclaimed Ideas series produced by the CBC. But Mr. Cayley is also well known for his close friendship and collaboration with the man who will be the focus of our discussion today, the philosopher and social cr critic, Ivan Illich. David Cayley, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michelle. Um, a lot of, uh, I'm sure a lot in the audience are um, anticipating uh, this episode. I've had requests to do an Ivan Illich episode and we're delighted to, to have you with us. But I think we have to assume that many in the audience do not know who Ivan Illich is, or if they do know, they have maybe a very superficial uh, knowledge of him. Why don't you give us, um, uh, first of all, uh, a sketch of his, uh, who, his life, who, who, who he was and, and what his life was. He, he died in 2002 and was born in 1926. So, so we have that you know, three quarters of a century right. of Ivan Illich. Take it away. Well, it, it's hard to know how much to say, but he was a, he was a European. He was born, uh, his, his father's family came from Dalmatia in what was then Yugoslavia, uh, sort of landed nobility of Dalmatia with patents of nobility from the Doge of Venice going back to the 18th century. His mother's family was Jewish and her, her father was a great uh, lumber baron in Yugoslavia, and the marriage was ill-fated between his parents because of the Jewish issue. So he ended up growing up in the house of grandfather in Vienna, a magnificent Art Nouveau palace. Uh, during the course of the war, uh, was basically transposed from a half Aryan to a half Jew, fled Vienna for Italy, uh, was educated in Salzburg and Rome at the Gregorian University and was, everyone in Rome had their eyes on him as a potential prince of the church. But he fled to New York and began working in a Puerto Rican parish. So he, he, he was ordained a priest. He was an ordained, yeah, sorry, I missed that part. He was an ordained Catholic priest ordained in 1951 and left shortly thereafter for New York, where he became fascinated with the Puerto Rican migration to New York and became a great voice for the Puerto Ricans in the New York church. Do, do you know his, um, because it, it sounds that maybe his family was more, I mean, if it was a mixed marriage among his parents, maybe a more secular family. Uh, what uh, do, do you know anything about his early um, path towards the priesthood? Well, although the family were Jewish, his mother was devoutly Christian. Right. So uh, it wasn't okay. a particularly secular upbringing. I don't know much about Grandpapa's views. Okay. But he was certainly uh, he was an acolyte in the church. He he never said much about his faith, or but he he certainly grew up in the Catholic Church. Okay. So after New York, he went to Puerto Rico, where he became vice rector of the university and became more and more involved in the question of mission. So in the 1960s, the Roman church decided that they were going to focus on missions to Latin America and that the American church would send fully 10% of its strength to Latin America as missionaries, one way and another. Mm -hmm. And Illich opposed it through a center he by then had established in Cuernavaca, which eventually was called CEDOC. And his argument was that this was not mission, this was rather imperialism, uh, an attempt to um, replace the vernacular Catholicism of Latin America, such as it was, and to impose an American model. He, um, he had a staunch friend in Cardinal Spellman, who was the Archbishop of New York and an arch conservative. He, he blessed the bombers that flew to Vietnam, but he was staunchly loyal to Ivan Illich. Mm -hmm. 
So it was only when Spellman died in 67 that Illich got into trouble with the church and was summoned to Rome, really in a formal process of inquisition, uh, the holy office as it was by then called. Um, he refused to cooperate. Eventually he withdrew from the church. He, he, he did not renounce, but he suspended uh, an important distinction for him, his priesthood, mm -hmm. and became um, essentially, uh, you could say he exercised his priesthood by other means, but he began, he became known then to the world after 68, and especially in 1970 for a series of books criticizing contemporary institutions. Uh, the first of them was called Deschooling Society, and that was followed by Energy and Equity, Tools for Conviviality, and finally the book we'll probably end up talking about, which is Medical Nemesis, Right. Uh, later Limits to Medicine in a more complete edition. And so that, and, and during those years, he was um, extremely famous. He, he was constantly on the move, he, and he tried to seize his opportunity. He was constantly on the move, constant, constantly lecturing, constantly being interviewed. What was and his big? Then, what was his big break? I mean, how would how do you go from being? Um, I mean, uh, uh, I think he was his base was Cuernavaca in in, uh, yes, in Mexico, was. right? Yeah. And um, what do you know what his big break was, or how did he get propelled to? I mean, you know, worldwide. Well, fame. he was a brilliant and charismatic man. Sure. Okay. Uh, able in almost every language that he was exposed to. So that was part of it. I think the temper of the times must mm -hmm. count fairly heavily also. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, for me, the brilliance of these critiques, um, which reading back into them from work we did together much later, he basically saw modern institutions as transposed churches, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And claimed, for example, in de-schooling society that these churches should be disestablished as other churches had been. So he never argued against schools as such, but rather he argued against monopolies. That was a, a critical point. And the other, I would say, critical point in all those books was the identification of thresholds beyond which institutions uh, become, as he said, paradoxically counterproductive. So in other words, the issue of scale was tremendously important in his work. And he, in that way, belongs to a school of, can you say, political ecology? which would very much include Fritz Schumacher, E.F. Schumacher, um, Leopold Kaur, small, small uh, others, beautiful. yes, who, who are, are probably not recognized and might be the saving voice in our left-right polarization if anyone ever begins to listen. Right, right. So very after yeah. 76, now this story goes on, and I don't want to tell you more than you want to know. In 19... He became interested, he, after this period of institutional critique was finished, he came to the conclusion that he had to go deeper into history to really understand the grip that modern institutions exercise on our imaginations. So that led to a studies in, in history, particularly in economic history, and eventually produced a book in 1982, the lectures were given in Berkeley, just across the bay from you. Uh, and the book was called Gender, and it created a bit of a scandal. Illich was seen to be endorsing the old regime rather than trying to bring history as a, a lens onto the present. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think after that, he was never, he, he kind of lost the reputation of a progressive thinker. Okay. And uh, although he was always a kind of godfather to the European Greens, and he lost that status in North America, which was a blessing in a certain way, because it allowed him in the last part of his life to live more freely and less 
uh, as an intellectual celebrity. But we may get into that, but there seemed that there, it seems that there was an evolution in his thought and perspective on things. Uh, at least that seems to be apparent when you, when you read the the new the new uh, the preface or the, the new introduction to limits to medicine. Yes. Um, I mean, he, as you say in your article, he doesn't. Uh, and, and by the way, before I, I get lost here for the audience, you wrote. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons we have you on is that you wrote a, a, an outstanding essay uh, on your website, davidkaley.com, where you um, you reflect on. First of all, you introduce the thought of Ivan Illich to the reader, and then you you speculate on what you know, he, he might have thought about our current COVID crisis right. and so forth. And so, and you mentioned that uh, uh, when the, you know, the current editions of, of Medical Nemesis, you know, his, his book on medicine, his critique of modern medicine and healthcare, um, the cu current edition has a new preface or a new introduction where he, he, he doesn't, rep you know, repudiate what he said back then, but, but he, it shows an evolution in his thoughts. Absolutely. Um, right. Um, but let's so let's go back to to limits to medicine, which uh, okay. made, made kind of a splash in the medical world. And, and um, you know, many in, in our audience would be uh, will be familiar with with, with the book. And uh, 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 an essay of his was published in The Lancet, I think, 1974 or 75, something like that. Uh, maybe excerpts from the book. Um, Tell us what what are the major ideas in that in that book? Well, it's it's one of his best developed books, and I couldn't possibly do it justice. But uh, a central idea is the damage medicine does to society. Mm -hmm. So the medical establishment has become the major threat to health as its opening line. And he divides what he calls iatrogenic, physician-caused damage into three categories. The, the basic one everyone knows, you get the wrong surgery, the wrong drug, right? The, that's the overt harm. Right. But he also goes on to say he thinks there are subtler uh, and more consequential harms uh, to our thinking, to our ways of life. Right, and the, and this argument culminates in what he calls cultural iatrogenesis, by which he says that medicine, beyond a certain point, and you have to understand this argument I said before about thresholds. Right, this is always important. Right, he is never criticizing the institution totally. He's saying there is a point beyond which it ceases to be effective and becomes the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, a very old idea, right? What you find in many thinkers. And McLuhan, reversal, Carl right. Jung, and Antiodromia. That's expressed in many ways. But he had that idea constantly. So, it's not a, a root and branch critique of medicine. It's an attempt to say what is good and what is harmful. And what he says above all is that the cultural capacities to suffer, to die, to care for one another are being impaired by too much medicine. By, you know, and then that's a, mm -hmm. an insane generalization, but you know, that's, that's the essence of the argument. Right, so uh, one way to-, to you, you have to, beyond a certain point, humanity, begins to replace its vital capacities rather right. than to enhance them or support them or aid them. Yes, so clearly, I mean, th there's a, a very strong uh, dehumanizing impact of modern medical care on society, on the way we view ourselves, on the way we're able to sustain uh, suffering or deal with illnesses and diseases and it becomes very pervasive and uh, and there's a lot of um, um, I mean it manifests in, in, in many different ways maybe we'll get into those uh, uh, in detail when we talk about you know the, the COVID aspect of things yes um, how um, 
maybe, you know, there may be people who are familiar with Ivan Illich or not familiar with Ivan Illich, but maybe familiar with what seems to be a, a related uh, critic, the, the postmodern critic, uh, the, the critic that Michel Foucault is famous for, um, of viewing medicine as sort of, a, you know, the new priesthood, uh, yes. uh, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the power of, uh, of, the, of the state, you know, being channeled through the medical institutions to, to control people. Um, I think, uh, you know, in fact, I, I think Ivan Illich refers to Michel Foucault in his book uh, at, at various points. Yes, and they knew each other. Right. Yeah. Is there any, so how do you distinguish one from the two or what? Um... Well, that's a really good question and, and quite a complex one. But uh, superficially, I would say that Illich is a Christian. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Foucault is a Nietzschean. Uh, that that would be the shortest answer. They they certainly overlap very considerably, and I think they enjoyed their conversations with one another. But yeah, that's the primary difference. Right. And obviously, Foucault develops his ideas of biopower much more systematically than than Illich ever did. Right. So Illich uh, agrees with Foucault about. The, these institutions, he, so uh, at least to me, it seems um, um, does uh, Illich doesn't seem to go into the step-by-step -step historical development of the medical institutions. The way, for example, I mean, I, I have, I mean, people, you know, the audience will, will hear me maybe just, you know, uh, roll their eyes back whenever they hear me talk about licensing. But, you know, medical licensing to me is a big step. Yes. You know, where, where the, the state, I don't recall, I mean, I've, I, I, I don't say, I can't, I can't say that I've read it carefully recently, uh, you know, limits to medicine, but I don't, I'm not, I don't recall sort of uh, Illich analyzing exactly the, 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 the power plays and what the American Medical Association did in the 1910s to, and what the, uh, you know, all these sort of, um, uh, political maneuverings that placed, you know, one foundation after another for for our current, you know, healthcare system. No, I would say he doesn't do that. Right. He okay. he, yeah. he was a provocateur. Okay. You know, he 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 planted his minds and he moved on in certain ways. Like that, there are exceptions to that. Uh, in limits to medicine, the chapter on death. It's very well argued historically. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, a, a strong sense of the, the, the French Revolution in the early 19th century, the development of, you know, the, the beginnings of the, of the new style of, you know, anatomical rather than humoral medicine. Uh, but no, there's very little about the, the early 20th century, for example, right. and the organi so, reorganization of the medical schools, the, all the politics uh, there is, is, is left out. It's true. Right. So how, how would he deal with the, I mean, the easy counter that, you know, he's a Luddite. He's not, I mean, it's very one-sided. It's all about, you know, the, um, the harms of, you know, but it's, at the same time, people seem to be very happy to have the availability of having kidney transplants and, and you know, chemotherapy and, you know, nobody's ready to give that up. And uh, what is he talking about? You know, uh, so, so how, how well, does he deal with this? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I'm not, not sure he does deal with it. I mean, he believed that the world that he and the world in the 1960s and 1970s was at a turning point, right? Mm -hmm. There are there are moments in deschooling society where he says that deschooling is imminent. There are moments in medical nemesis where he says that a major house cleaning in the health professions is imminent. 
I, I can only read those. I mean, I knew the man later, right? <laughs> Much later, really. We we met. He came here to Toronto in the late '60s, and but. The, the friendship that we had began in 88, you know, much later on. Okay. But as I read him in those years, I think he really believed that this was the moment of now or never, right? That the paradoxical counterproductivity was a fate that awaited. And I would say it, it's in his terms, a fate that has overtaken us. Right. So he was very impressed let's say by what was done in Chile before 73, where they tried to identify a basic medical armamentarium, right? We will have, we will have these drugs, these procedures, this way of carrying on, that's enough. China was also trying with the barefoot doctors to accomplish something similar, like what is effective medical care? And obviously he came to the conclusion and this now you're in the eighties now when he reflects back on medical nemesis and says, well, yeah, that's, that's all very well, but things have changed, right? And now people have in effect moved imaginatively, spiritually inside a health concept, right? Right. Whereas he was talking still as if the medical system were in his sense, a tool tools for conviviality. I mean, it's a pretty big tool, <laughs> but, but he used the term that way, whatever you stand, whatever you can stand apart from and could potentially, a majority potentially could be assembled to change this, right? To say, this is enough medicine. This is the roof under which we wish to live. This, these are the tools that we can manage, and these are the tools that are managing us and which we refuse right. the argument of tools for conviviality. Well, evidently, by the 1990s, that not we well, were the machine had overtaken everything, and inc including our imagination. Well, he that was his argument when he began to believe in the 1980s that what he hadn't seen in the 70s was the signs of what he laterally called the age of systems and the great distinction that he makes it's, it's pretty rudimentary but is you know a tool using this in the very big sense in which most people would speak of technology is 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 an invention of the 12th century well, you can see man man the tool user in the diorama the museum in the stone age right but he that's not the way he spoke he spoke of this idea of a means that you can take in hand that's separate from you, a means of production, if you like, in Marx's terms, and that that era lasts into our time, but is overtaken by the world of systems in which you don't stand outside, you stand inside. You become a cog in that, you, you become in, in, the, yeah, in the system. You, be, you become, yeah. Right. Every every intervention you make in the system is part of the system. It's the cybernetic worldview. He was tremendously impressed by it. Right. So I um, I mean I want to just to summarize what you just said. He, he was um, uh, you have a line here in your essay. Quote: He Ivan Illich was generally favorable to the large scale innovations in public health, meaning clean water and oh, yeah. that sort of thing that have given us food, safe water, clean air, sewage disposal, et cetera. He also praised efforts then underway in China and Chile to establish a basic medical toolkit and pharmacopoeia that would be available and affordable for all citizens. Um, so, so that he was okay with. Clearly no praise for any of the, what the, you know, most people would consider to be a, sort of the boon of mo modern medical care. The fact that you know if you can have a heart attack and and be resuscitated and, and all that stuff, and I, I mentioned that because you know I interrupted you when you were talking about the man and his life. There's a very important point in how he lived himself, illness, and perhaps yes. as an example. I mean, so can you tell us a little bit about what uh, um, uh, you know what what disease afflicted him and and how he ended up? Well, dying? he wasn't a to begin. He wasn't a fundamentalist. 
I, okay. I think about anything, and, and he wasn't a fundamentalist about medica, medicine. He had dental surgery, I can remember. He had a hernia operated on when it became uncomfortable to walk and sit. Okay. But when this tumor appeared on his cheek, likely a cancer of the parotid gland for those who are interested in such things. Mm -hmm. But he, he decided that that was to be his destiny. He, he had various advisors that persuaded him that way. Um, one was a Pakistani a doctor in the Unani tradition that still is a kind of it's a development out of Galenic medicine that still is, is practiced in Pakistan. And he loves that man. And he, he said, you know, you, you, you keep that, you live with that. That's part of you. That's part of your person. There were other, uh, there were other things that persuaded him that way, but he, it was certainly a, a decision to live with something, which he then did for 20, two years approximately. He suffered a good deal from it. It became a you know, sort of grapefruit-sized tumor, which disfigured his cheek and caused a good deal of pain, uh, which, which he managed by smoking opium, uh, which was he found to be very effective in sort of moving the pain away. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was his illness. Um, Right, and his, and that was part of him. And and we think he died of that, or presumably, or well, no one around know. him would have dared to say what he died of. Um, that was think, which itself is of, a concept that, that is was part of how with, we right. learned to think with him. Right, he 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 died. Right, he had drunk his cup to the lees. I mean, he really lived well. Right, and. He lived long, and he uh, he was done that morning. He lay right. down and died. And to say that he died of cancer, nobody ever knew it was cancer. Right. Uh, it was never diagnosed. And that was a great thing with him, the right to be undiagnosed. Yeah, I mean, I think this is remarkable because, I mean, it shows a great deal of uh, integrity between what he's saying again it's not perfect and and how he lives his life no you have to be willing to right. suffer right exactly but on the other i mean it wasn't i think it's important to say that that you know cancer is metastasized and surgery might be a, a, might induce that might cause that to happen but he he did he wasn't playing odds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just right. came to the conclusion, and so that I mean there, there's an there's what I see in that is the ability to and the capacity to discern meaning in what happens to us, right? Mm -hmm. Which no other could possibly know, right? It it isn't seen objectively. It isn't seen from the outside as this is this, and we know what to do about it, and we always do that because that's what you do about that. No, it it it, it utterly comes from a, a different worldview, which for me was a, a kind of revelation. In the sense that he he suffered gloriously, he had a good time. I mean, uh, like right. to have a good time, right? And. Uh, and yet, I think he inspired people around him. Right. And that's a great thing. Right. I mean, it, it's it almost would take that sort of um, uh, example, you know, personal example of how you deal with to to make the point uh, that he was trying to make. Again, I'm I'm not saying that that he 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 decided to deal with his cancer just you know precise just you know to il illustrate you know. No, it, point, it was but, not. It had no pedagogical. No, but but nevertheless, I mean, it's it's. Um, you know, I mean, if he had been admitted at Memorial Sloan Kettering and spent, you know, and and you know, had millions of dollars spent, you know, to take care of of this or that, you know, 
people might have questioned a little bit, you know, what what uh, all of this, you know, recrimination against the healthcare system we're about. Yes, perhaps. Right. Um, so uh, th there is a before we get to the COVID part. In this second phase, I mean, is maybe the more mature uh, Ivan Ilyich looking back at at um, at what he had written before. Yeah, you're right. He he views the system as being now sort of, and then human beings as being disembodied, right? I mean, being considered like disembodied machines or mechanics or little parts or. Um, well, yes, he did. He felt people had internalized. Uh, system concepts and to that extent I mean he was very impressed one day this is a trivial little story but um, a young woman at, he used to teach at the Penn State University in the fall and this woman came uh, to visit and was offered a glass of cider and she said no she she couldn't take a glass of cider because her sugar requirements for the day were already met <laughs> and right. Ivan was great greatly impressed by by the fact that an offer of hospitality would be met by a consideration of sugar requirements or right right, right. He, he he felt he was meeting people who right and then you think of all the things that are internalized risk that's right. right. So, so that would be my, my next point. But I think because it, it's very vivid because I uh, I wrote a couple of essays, you know, cri critiquing and, and I didn't come to it from from Ivan Ilyich's perspective, but critiquing this obsession with risk calculation in medicine. I mean, we're all told that we're, we treat according to risk and we have these formulas. So you meet somebody, you measure their cholesterol level, you how old they are, what, how much they weigh. You put that in the, you plug it in, you see what the risk of a heart attack is going to be in the next 10 years. And that tells you what to do. I mean, it's completely absurd, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's the bread and butter of medicine. I mean, it, it's, yes. you know, we have, we have uh, you know, classes and classes of medical students just being taught exactly that. So that's, that's what uh, I, I thought was so interesting uh, in your essay, you bring out his um, uh, attention of it where, you know, uh, Illich conceived it as a disembodying, you know, that can best be understood by the example of risk awareness, which he called the most important religiously celebrated ideology today. I think that's great. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, he uh, believed that. Right. And I believe I, it too. I believe it yeah, too. Yeah. I, I, I believe it too. Uh, so this, this constant attention to risk, being risk aware of this, risk aware of that. And... Um, and, and how you know paralyzing it is and and then how absurd it is and it has no really no relationship no cogent relationship to what human beings are and to I mean it's not it's even almost anti-scientific to talk about risks because there's no such thing as the individual risk I mean you don't have a risk it's only about a yeah, population so of people here. right yeah that you you identify yourself with a figment which is your informational doppelganger, the, the right. person like you right. who might have this happen to them. Exactly. And that's you. Exactly. Right? Right. You are the person who is right. like you. Right. Rather than you. Right. Uh, with, with some intuitions of your own, with, if you were lucky, a doctor who might also see you as a person and, and have some sense of you as a, as a you know, yeah. Yeah. As I, a so, I, not, as, not as a risk. Am I am I allowed to protest? Yeah, go ahead because I actually I was I was going to bring you in at this point before we talk <laughs> about the the covid thing. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, so I find um it, it, this touches on uh, I, I, your essay by the way um uh, Dr. Kelly is, is is fantastic. It's really wonderful. Uh, you know, an 8800 word opus on uh, on on what's going on. And I, I think it feels like you have um, you've kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of what's what's going on, and, and you're using Illich to do it. Um, but of course, it's interesting that Illich, you know, had a great love for public health interventions. Correct? Yes. <laughs> and and yeah. yet you're using you're using and, and you know he 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 could not stand 
this type of medicalization and this type of very technical, uh, you know, approach to um, uh, to medicine and the body and you know this the the, the different parts that one could replace and whatnot. Um, uh, uh, but but now, of course, in your essay, you have, of course, you're using, your, yet you use Illich to talk about um, how public health has kind of gone awry, uh, correct? Yes. Um, well, yeah, I guess I could, you could say that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, so that, and that's always been my issue with Illich. My issue with Illich is that he's not sufficiently granular, uh, you know, so... It, you, you like it requires somebody, you know, Illich, his concepts are wonderful and, and he's correct, but it requires somebody with some deeper knowledge of, in your case, you know, you're, you're nicely seeing what's happening in terms of the panic that's being aroused, uh, you know, in terms of how uh, the public health community is being given, you know, cart carte blanche in terms of to do whatever and, you know, uh, uh, kind of take over civil liberties and whatnot. Um, but you know, you you so you're able to do that. Um, on the other hand, if you have some someone someone in, in medicine and uh, you know physicians and stuff, there are clearly like I've written these long, you know, a long essay on on how cardiac MRI is being used uh, too much and it's medicalizing large swaths of the population. If you do enough, you know, if you if you image enough you will find some blobs that light up and you will say, aha, there's something here when, you know, the patient is totally fine. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I mean, so, you know, but my, my point is Ivan Illich doesn't have the, the, the knowledge base to be sufficiently granular to figure out what is, what is, you know, uh, simply, medicalizing and simply kind of you know labeling people with disease or or making them have pre you know uh, well, um, uh, what is the word that you said uh, uh, pre-existing disease or you know the, the pre-diseases uh, right yeah pre-disease you're right? pre-disease uh, yeah that was a pre-disease that was a, a wonder, health wonder. researcher in victoria who came yeah up but with but that, that but that requires a certain depth of knowledge that and you know and i so ivan illich is he well just, can i answer yes yes no please do yes. i think he had that knowledge at a certain okay. time like if you, he worked with a Frenchman called Jean-Pierre Dupuis mm -hmm. and they were, th those studies of how Frenchmen were using, or French women were using the medical system in the early seventies as, as a, a, a form of striking was Dupuis expression, right? All the different ways in which the medical system interacted with how people actually felt those studies are quite that Dupuis was doing are quite granular, right? And uh, you know, right, what, what, sorry, what, 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 the nuts and bolts of how people are living. So I think, I think Ivan had a pretty good grasp at a certain time. Now, obviously, he he's not going to deal with things that happened. Yeah. years after he died. But, but 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 that but that would be the point, right? So in nineteen, uh, when, when was Medical Nemesis written? Uh, what 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 year? Nineteen seventy. Seventy five, seventy six. Right. So in nineteen seventy five, when he's writing now, now when you go back and read what he's writing, and he, and he's talking very um, uh, firmly about, say, breast cancer, right? And the five year survival for breast cancer has not changed, despite you know what what everything we've been doing and surgery has, you know. There was a grain of truth to that at the time in the 19, in 1975. Um, uh, there there were there were some hopeful trends within the medical community that you know folks at the National Cancer Institute were were very optimistic they would realize the potential of the research they were doing. Correct, um, and and so you know, but but you know, well, he certainly got things wrong. R right, right. I mean, so life expectancy would be a major one, right? Right, right. He argued again and again that life expectancy had peaked and was declining, and that was what you would expect based on his theories. Right, and that has not turned out to be true. Right. Plus, I think now you can I, I, you can then you can then ask what what life is this that's right, extended right. indefinitely? Right, but. He he was wrong about it. He, he was wrong about lots of things. Yeah, but I think Anisha, I think you you missed the point because what mm -hmm. David said earlier is that he was yeah. a provocateur in I mean many ways. He's not he was not a scientist. He's not writing as a scientist, a, a guy trying to to be correct and God forbid trying to predict the future. Right? He was just trying to kick the can. I mean, you know, kick 
you know, I mean, try to just, I mean, am I correct, uh, David? I mean, in a way, I mean, I, I, think I may be exaggerating, can. but but he 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 was more interested in sort of, you know, rattling rattling the cage of the monster rather than trying to parse exactly and be, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, and, and in parsing the good and the bad and the this yeah, and the but, that. But the problem is, you know, it, he's such a powerful influence in people because the, the issue is, uh, how, how do we say, you know, in, 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 in retrospect, in hindsight, uh, one can identify waste very easily. It is very much, 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 much harder to identify a waste prospectively. Um, so, so you know, um, the, the the problem is so. I uh, so I'm, we're, we're both cardiologists, and um, uh, well, one of the one of, one of the one of the things that came up was that um, you know uh, before before cataract surgeries, um, you know, every now and then uh, patients are sent to be evaluated from a medical standpoint, right? And and so. But cataract surgeries are very, very simple surgeries um, that, you know, you don't really need much of a medical, you know, if you're walking, talking, don't yes. have chest pain, don't have breathing trouble, uh, you know, and you can't see, you know, go get your cataract taken out. Um, but for a variety of different reasons, you know, it, it turns out that these folks end up in, in a physician's care so that some physician can label them as okay to undergo their cataract surgery. Um, now, and, and as part of that, an electrocardiogram is done. And, and, you know, there was this big JAMA article about how these electrocardiograms are, are a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, as, as, as given proffered as, as evidence for why this was a waste was, uh, was, was this paper that suggested that, you know, the large percentage of folks, you know, didn't, didn't benefit from them. But, you know, cataracts, as you know, happen in an age group over the age of 65. Folks that are the folks, the, the biggest risk factor to somebody who's over the age of 65 in terms of their lives ending is having a, having some type of a cardiac, cardiac event. So, you know, there's, there's so in people that are under, that have not been seen, are not being seen by physicians. And the first time they've seen a physician in five years is somebody during this cataract evaluation. No. It's like, what what exactly am I supposed to do as a as a physician trained in this current climate? I mean, you know, you 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 you're trying to not just say you're okay for your cataract surgery. You're just trying to do a medical evaluation and say, do I hear a very loud murmur? Do I see something that would suggest that you're you're at some risk of something happening to you? And sometimes that starts with just a very simple, non-sensitive stuff like listening to the heart. Or doing a simple EKG that's you know ten or twelve dollars. Uh, now that is very different than taking the entire population, giving them an Apple Watch, and you know having that Apple Watch beep anytime there's some irregular rhythm that's noted, and then that irregular alarm that's noted that wakes you. You know that you know when you wake up at seven a.m. like oh my god, you know my Apple Watch is telling me that something happened, and then you rush to see your cardiologist. Right. You, so you see, that, that this is what I mean by people losing the plot a little bit. It's that, it's that they kind of lump those two things together, right? I mean, so, you know, I made the point that, look, if you look at the study of folks over the age of 65 who end up getting an EKG, 30% of the time they find some, something that we, we would want to know as physicians. I mean, I would have to plead with Dr. Illich to say, you know, just believe me that you'd want to know this <laughs> because, you know, arrhythmias that can cause strokes, et cetera. Right. And again, this isn't an over 65. My, my point is that to me seems not an unreasonable thing to do. Whereas there are other things like doing a cardiac MRI and every single person that has, that had COVID six months yeah. ago, yeah. that is, that is, that is, that's ridiculous or an Apple watch. Well, so thank God for your good sense. Things. But right, but let but me how do you say right? Right. Illich is how, yeah, how would, would how would Illich approach that? Yeah. That yes, all how, our institutions are are in a state of hypertrophy, of overgrowth. Medicine is just one of them. The province of Ontario spends almost half its budget yeah. on healthcare, and it's not enough. Everyone knows it's not enough. It will never be enough. How can it ever be enough? 
If we are now entering a period of economic contraction, as it would appear, and skyrocketing national debts, it's going to get worse. There'll be less than enough. But that has to do so with- So that's Illich's view. Right. That there, these institutions are all in a state of overgrowth. Now, in detail, can he tell you, do this, don't do that? Is this a good procedure? Is that not a good procedure? Well, no. You're exercising good sense and God bless you. So, uh, as, but I wouldn't blame right. him. But I'll tell you why why uh, Anish is rattled, uh, uh, David. <laughs> it's because uh, Illich uh, may have inspired, and I think I think he realizes it. Uh, I mean, you know, when the more mature Illich looks back at what what has happened, he may have inspired a lot of uh, do-gooder, uh, you know, people who decided, "Aha, yes, we're doing too much. We need less. You know, less is more." The new mantra. Right. Less is more, but it's less is more with a, the same systems approach. We're going to do less is more across the board. What, what Anish is complaining about is that people who come and say, Can I tell you, know, you a story? The, 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 go yes. ahead, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One day, Ivan was visiting and, and he turned to my wife, Yuda, and he said, Imagine how much harm I did with all those books. <laughs> and you know, one does harm by putting forward ideas because the ideas are mistaken. Right. They're misapplied. They are, you know, misappropriated. I mean, anyone who has been, you you must have both the experience of <laughs> doing some, can I call this a broadcast that you do? Yeah, yeah. And have someone who's completely misunderstood what you said <laughs> or what you meant or what you intended. Anish, I, I tend mean, to be very clear. Of course, of course that. those can be misappropriated. Right. Yes. Right. Right. No. So, but, but, I mean, but you said it beautifully. Um, I, I think he needs to be. He has wonderful ideas that need to be applied. That need to be applied by folks. You can't just apply them in a. You know, you can't take somebody who doesn't have any sense and start spouting illich and expect that you're going to get something wonderful that comes out. Well, you can't as, expect it. Yeah, your your I mean, essay, your well, essay. I, I, oops, sorry. Did you, your 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 essay is is just a wonder. Is just fantastic, and and so you know what you, you what you do what you've done in terms of kind of describing, you've described so wonderfully well. And I wonder if I'm sure if if Dr. Illich was alive today, he would. Father Illich, not Dr. Illich. Father, Father Illich. Father Illich. <laughs> he would. He would. He would. Uh, he would completely agree uh, with you in terms of what has happened here uh, over the course of the last uh, six months. Um, so re really great. Michelle, yeah, so are you going to get yeah, that? Yeah. No, I, I, just a few highlights. I mean, what, what yeah. those points are regarding to COVID. Yeah, yeah, please. This complete obsession, you know, we talked about this risk uh, adversity, this complete obsession with saving, quote unquote, saving lives. That, as you, as you said, David, in your essay, it, it's... Uh, you uh, epistemic sentimentality right <laughs> or yes you know where we, we we because we're saving lives we feel like we're participating in some you know great uh you know kumbaya thing but without regards to what we're doing at all and in fact we're saving lives that we of people we've never met we don't even talk to our neighbors and you know it, it's all of this is you know again the machine the systems taking over go ahead anish I, I mean, this is a wonderful passage, um, uh, you know, where you say at the date at which I'm writing early April, no one really knows what is going on. Um, that is probably still true today. Since no one knows how many have the disease, nobody knows what the death rate is. Italy's is currently listed at over 10%, which puts it in the range of the catastrophic influence at the end of the World War One. Germany's is at 0.8%, which is more in line with what happens unremarked every year. Some very old people, a few younger ones catch the flu and die. What does seem clear here in Canada, and this is the wonderful part, is that with the exception uh, of a few local sites of true emergency, the pervasive sense of panic and crisis is largely a result of the measures taken against the pandemic and not of the pandemic itself. <laughs> right. And, and those, and th how, how do you think that, how do you think that in your estimation, how do you think those words that you wrote have, have aged since April? Well, not to call myself a prophet, I, I think they <laughs> did very well because because people were terrified, and they are they remain terrified. Right. Uh, and so the 
the reaction I've had to a more recent article, which is similar in a Canadian magazine, is that everybody praises it and then goes on as they were before, because essentially what they're living in is, is panic fear, right? Nobody must get this disease is, is the axiom, is seemingly our political axiom. Like none is too many. And how there's never been a vaccine, an effective vaccine against a coronavirus. There might be one, but it's 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 a bit of a crapshoot, no? right? I, I don't know if you and, if... and so what what else what alternative is there besides ruining yourself and making people miserable, suicidal, addled, anxious, violent, and without jobs and you know their businesses in tatters in order to not catch the flu because some people it might be worse for some people yes it might so i mean i i regard it as a kind of i mean you've got me started now i'm speaking <laughs> no, no, deliberately please. but but i i think it's a kind of madness actually that has overtaken us uh and nobody seems to be able to see it right I, well, uh, I don't know if you're familiar. I'm standing David. in the street saying the emperor, emperor's got nothing on. Right. And everybody else is seeing his magnificent finery, seemingly. But why are you If not... you're familiar, sorry, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the satirical um, site called the Babylon Bee. It, no. it's, it's sort of like, I don't know if you, you knew the onion back then, but the, the Babylon Bee is, is sort the of. The onion a, I knew, yeah. The Babylon Bee is a, is a uh, Christian, more right wing version of the onion. And, 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 and they're kind of, they're, they're really hilarious. And they had one, one headline recently where it was Governor Newsom, you know, in California, the Governor Newsom uh, announced that lockdowns would continue until the cure for death is discovered, until, until scientists discover the cure for death, right? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> that's good. That's very I good. Mean, can, I, can I interject something here? Yeah. Because this is, I mean, I had, this has really been very disturbing to me. I I, um, I picked up my morning newspaper the, earlier in the week. This is the Globe and Mail, Toronto paper or national newspaper. And I had been thinking, well, you know, this is, yes, there's a rising number of cases, but the deaths don't seem to be increasing. Uh, necessary hospitalizations don't seem to be increasing much. Um, this may not be all that alarming. And to read in the case of the Globe and Mail's medical reporter, who's very much lionized in, in Canada right now, that I belong to a group. Uh, and this group is claiming that this is a case-demic, an expression I've never heard before. And that this, along with the people who claim it's a case-demic are another group called fake news chanters. So you're, you're without denier. having known any of this, I'm already classified and I'm classified with the far right, which is kind of a disturbing experience for someone who, if they ever identified politically, certainly identified on the left. Uh, and I think we really, really need to renovate our political discourse and, and make new alliances because this it's just not working when, when, when common sense, if, if anything that comes out of my mouth resembles anything Donald Trump has ever said, you know, out, right? Right. We can't have you. You're, you're a Trumpian. You're, ah. it's, it's just, it's so shallow. The best thing Trump And it's do, so completely right. politicized and the subject is so arbitrarily divided in half that it just seems impossible to imagine the political future without some loosening, right? The, the redevelopment of spaces for discussion, the, 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 de the de escalation of, you know, it, it pervades everything now. The universities, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, where I worked for many years, is, is, is a kind of cheerleader. It's not a space of thought. Right. And that space of thought seems to me what is space of uncommitted thought. Let's say it like that. 
that seems to me the great thing to fight for now. Well, but even, 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 I mean, I, I think even, um, uh, even Donald Trump uh, eventually caved, uh, right? I mean, you were writing this in April, and I think in April, uh, you know, Mr. Trump was still, um, uh, you know, hoping for the best and that this would, right? You know, uh, taking an approach that was not perhaps as um, authoritarian as as some would like, and then and then you know, uh, once once there's more and more pressure, you know, basically, you know, I think I think. You know, even he caved to, uh, you know. Well, I think the political pressure was overwhelming. I mean, yeah. I don't. I, I'm. I'm. I hope my article doesn't seem at any point to say that a politician could, in a democratic milieu, could could have easily with under, withstood yeah. this. My whole point was that the thought forms have been building to the point where the actions that were taken seem obvious even though no one had ever heard of social distancing before no one had ever tried <laughs> to quarantine a healthy population before right right yet, yet un almost unthinkable and yet it seemed so, so how, obvious and, and, that and we so, ought to do this and that anybody who disagreed ought to sh shut up and 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 that this was all endorsed by science which that's right is a I, I was, I was going to myth because there was no science and there could be no science. I, mean, I was going to bring that up, uh, David. Let me, let me read a couple of sentences that uh, I thought were great. Uh, as you said, another related feature of the current landscape is government by science. And then you go on to say, epidemiologists may say frankly, as many have, that in the present case, there is very little study, sturdy evidence to go on, but this has not prevented politicians from acting as if they were merely the executive arm of science, capital S. Right. So, and this is, again, would be something that, uh, you know, Prophet Father Illich would have, you know, pointed to uh, this build up of this system thinking, right, where everything is ruled mechanically by, by the laws of, right, the physical laws of, of nature, and we simply have to follow what science says. Um, and and so, so so it's really remarkable. Um, but but talking about this left left right divide, uh, as you said, you're not the. This pandemic has sort of uh, created. I mean, you're not the only one who finds himself a little bit as odd with uh, the mainstream of one side and finding himself, you know, agreeing with God forbid Donald Trump and that sort of thing. Um, was was Illich a man of the left? Would you say? Or no, I would say he was a man who desperately pleaded for a new political map. Okay. So he wrote an essay called "This is back in the '70s." Called Three Dimensions of Public Choice" or "Public Option." It had different versions, mm -hmm. and he said that the left-right axis is intelligible. It does tell you something about the relationship between state and market, which, which predominates, but that you would need to even begin to map contemporary political space, two more axes. One would concern technological choice. They call that hard to soft, right? How, how much does this technique change society? Uh, are these tools convivial or monopolistic? Mm -hmm. And the third, he called an axis from having to being, right? Does this enable autonomous activity or does this create dependency? Does this is something that I can have because I can purchase it at Walmart or at the university or wherever I, I purchased the thing that I have, my education, my health, my this, my that. So that was his argument. And I, I accepted it as soon as I, I read that. And I've been a proponent of a redrawn political map ever since, but in vain. <laughs> and I don't think we can make sense of the world on this basis, right? So, um, right. 
because unless popular capacities of all kinds to think for yourself, to speak your own words, to exercise judgment, to be able to somehow contribute to livelihood without necessarily having a job because who can believe that there's, we're gonna go back to full employment. Uh, and certainly if we could go back to full employment, the rest of the world has never been close and never will be close. So that sphere, which he tried to name the vernacular sphere, which didn't really stick because vernacular is kind of, it's a language or maybe it's a kind of architecture, but the idea that this is actually a, a domain mm -hmm. of the homemade, of the popular, I mean, judgment is, is what is being injured above all here, right? The, the ability to, uh, I mean, I know so many people and even in my own family who are proud to tell me that they've resigned from trying to understand this, that they're just gonna follow the rules until it's over. And the right. number of people who are willing to embrace this terrifying idea of a new normal, right? As if the world just changed states and we wouldn't have anything to say about it. I mean, okay, what's the new normal? What do I do now? It's, 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 a, it's, bizarre, it's not right? a world of citizens. It's right. a world of upended beetles. Right. It's, it's quite uh, bizarre. So let me, uh, you know, make, maybe make my criticism of Illich from the other side, so to speak, compared to the, the you know, from the other tack than the tack Anish took. Um, you know, you, you, he, uh, Illich was, was, a, was, a, was a Christian, was a priest. I mean, I, I think a committed believer, I mean, it sounds, and, and is, especially in his more mature phase, I, I'm going to recommend, we haven't mentioned it yet, but there's a book that you co-wrote, or it's essentially, it's, I don't know if you tape recorded Ivan Illich speak freely, um, the rivers north of the, of the future, the book that you wrote with him. Yeah, those were interviews. Interviews, yeah. I think it's a wonderful book. It, it's really, it's, it's a magnificent book. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, part of part of my issue is that we, I mean, we're part of that system thinking, but we're kind of complicit in it, right? We, we I mean, there there are material benefits that we seem, I mean, very very short-sighted material benefits that we seem to, uh, I mean, they're less and less as the system becomes, you know, more and more suffocating, but nevertheless, we support the system because we feel we have our material comforts uh, that the system seems to give us this. Um, it may become, it may come crashing down, but for the time being, it's still, we, we have comfortable lives, so to speak. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't Illich be preaching Christ? instead of writing books uh, of philosophy. Wow. I believe he was. Okay. I believe he was. I think he, he felt that the philosophy of technology, to give a grand term mm -hmm. to all that he did, was ancillary and a necessary, necessarily ancillary to Christian life. Right? That if you are uh, mesmerized um, by all your toys and tools, if you are uh, if you are inside this health concept, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could give many many examples. You, you you can't hear. You're not you're not. You, you wouldn't recognize Christ if you met him. True. Since you spoke of Christ. And, and he, he was very much an incarnational Christian. Like he, he felt that Christ was mainly to be met with in, in one another, right? And in the chances of existence. But if you, if you try to eliminate chance from existence, right? If you try to... Uh, if you try to establish a total management, and I mean the, the the discourse of managing COVID and which societies did well and which did poorly, and 
it's it's a it's a, a discourse of total management. Like we should be able to control this. The Globe and Mail, the newspaper I mentioned, had an editorial. I think it was last week in which it announced that we were at war. We are at war with a virus. Right. We're made of viruses, for God's sake. <laughs> we're not going to be able to win a war with a virus, right? We might be, you know. Yeah, yeah. Might, no, it's 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 true, but it's. We might you know, I mean, be able it's, to negotiate a draw. It, it's diabolical because it's. Um, you know, you talk about this, uh, this uh, deification of health, right? Health has become, you know, has become the god and, and, and everything, all this risk management and, and health assessment and this yeah. sanitization of, of, uh, of life. So, so it, it, um, it pushes us to, to think only about our, I mean, right, we, we become very self-centered, right? I mean, it's our own risk and, and, and our own lives and, you know, and it's, it's very, it's at the level of our, you know, life in the, in the here and in, in this world that's, you know, that, we, you know, the only world that we know. I mean, my point is that it, it seems to me that the, the, the problems are, are so deep seated that it, it requires sort of a, a very deep, deep, um, uh, not only a change of heart, but but I mean, almost a, you know, a, a new revelation, a new re, a new encounter with God, with the divine, with the transcendental, with the spiritual aspect of dimension of 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 uh, what human beings are, because we are spiritual well, and so forth. Since you've read the Rivers North of the Future and you you brought it up, I mean, if you take that book seriously, he does say, and this was his settled conclusion in the last years of his life that you really cannot understand the modern world as a transposition of the church that is within the roman catholic church after the 12th century an ambition developed to actually make and administer a christian society unlike any ambition that had ever existed in any society ever before so the corruption of the best, as he said, is the worst, right? The, 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 the gift that they had received was so superb that they felt must enlist everyone. We must administer this salvation to the nth degree. Right. And, and if that is indeed how the modern world was made, then, and Illich wasn't the only one to say it, Paul Goodman called his last book a new reformation, right? A re, a re uh, experiencing of this basic thing is, is necessary, right? Yes. And a, a deep rethinking is necessary. And he's, he's an earnest when he calls risk a religious ceremonial, right? And right. he's an earnest when he says that life is a new idol, mm -hmm. right? It's a religious idol. He told cr groups of Christians that the life was the most dangerous idol that the church had faced in its history. He said that explicitly to a group of Lutherans in 1989 in Chicago. He meant it, right? It's, it's obscuring, uh, yeah. Correct, but, but there again, so the, so the message would have to be, you know, I mean, carefully crafted because, you know, I mean, again, as a Christian, the understanding is that life is a gift, nevertheless, right? So it's a gift that you receive. So it's not, it, it requires the proper ordering, right? So life oh, is yeah. precious, a, but it has to be ordered, right, to the greater good. And, and, and with, with a ruined language, you have to be very careful what you say. Right. And, and I think we have to accept, I mean, he, do I have time to say? Something yes, else? please. Yes. Okay. So in Tools for Conviviality, which was his, only attempt at a programmatic statement at how you might reform. Um, he says there are three things that are essential for recovery. The first is to get over the delusion about science, mm -hmm. right? Which is the myth, that's the political right. myth of science we spoke of before. He's not speaking against science as a practice. Uh, the second is the recovery of language. So he means to actually know what you're saying, to know what 
the, to, a, to be able to choose your own words and to rely on them, as, not as somebody else's words, not as something that has, you know, I mean, think how vast the realm of paid and manipulated speech is now. Sure. And, and the speed, of, the acceleration within media of, of the circulation of these uh, verbal pathogens. And the third one is law. He, he thinks that if people can get the law back in their hands, they could conceivably defend a limited way of life. So, yeah, you no, have to be right. able to know what you're saying. Now, I, I think we, we don't, by and large, know what we're saying, right? And th this, this experience for me of COVID is like, is being inside a large automaton, right? That, right. that, op that in a way operates itself, right? That there isn't really a, a space for thinking or consideration because every position is occupied in advance in a way. And right. so that's difficult. That's a difficult situation to live in and you can't, yeah, there is no simple answer to this. Oh, we need a new paradigm. Oh, we need, you know, it's, it's a systematic across the board criticism of how this all unfolded. Correct. I, I think this is, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. That? It's wonderful. Uh, I just, just, um, I'll share my thoughts on this with you. I mean, it's, it's, I don't have any, again, no, no particular solution, just a, a thought, but you mentioned the, this sort of the 12th century being a watershed moment in all this. And, and for the audience, I think that refers to, uh, a change of perspective among academics, among philosophers, really. I mean, I think we're talking about here in the 1300s, Don Scotus, William of Ockham, and people like that, that ended up, you know, it was, it was the beginning of, uh, you know, setting, planting the seeds for the scientific revolution. Yes. For essentially a completely different understanding of our relationship with creation, with the created world that leads to where we are right now. And then the question is, do we change that by again, an academic, starting an academic discourse to try to reverse, to point out? And I think it's, that's very important. So to the extent that Ivan Illich and others are doing that kind of work, I think it's very important. At the same time, it seems to me that it has to be, there has to be something that is not so intellectual and that maybe, you know, sort of a change from, Again, from the grassroots. I mean, he's he's an advocate of the vernacular, of of uh, the local, and so more of a you know um, pre thirteen hundred Saint Francis of Assisi, you know, walking around naked and that sort of thing. Um, well, except that he 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 even couldn't stop it, right? I mean, Saint Francis of Assisi was you know couldn't couldn't prevent the the changes since it's precisely Franciscans who, who, who may have been instruments of, um, of, of the, the, the edifice we find ourselves in. Well, my road has been to try and understand the things that Ivan said to me. Um, and I've got a big book coming out in February from the Penn State Press about him, okay. which is my attempt to, to say what this means now. Uh, but I don't see any way out of the very patient work and, and an attempt to live as joyfully as we can while we're doing it, right? There's, there's no easy answer because we went, if he was right, we went past the moment at which it might have been possible to write a constitution of limits, right? right. which is... An, an expression I invented for him, and he didn't say that, but I, I like it. A question of limits. But I don't see how eventually humanity will exist without a constitution of limits because we will otherwise just continue into the, into the post-human, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so that, I mean, and this, this isn't going to be without consequences, what we're going through now, right? It's going to be interesting times. 
and I, I don't see how the ever the demand for that services will be available for everything, right? Um, that we'll make the old age homes so much better now, right? That we'll have universal daycare now. Right. Yeah, and we'll have the healthcare system that is going to be even better, and well, everything will. I don't think it's going to be like that. Uh, and I, I think it's sort of there will be clearly a time to reflect if the spaces can be created. And I, I take it that you're trying to create one of them. No, it, it's uh, true. In which, true. in which reflection. Right. And what, what I think I was speaking to Anish. I said uncommitted. You know uncommitted thought can otherwise how can you possibly reconsider without a place to stand right. and the only way to do it is with with joy and humor and so i, I i'm so happy to see you laugh about this situation and i imagine ivan Illich would be laughing as well i mean he he, yeah, he, he likes to have a good he liked to right. have a good time right you know, right that was so, always his thing was was um, Joyfulness within limits, or <laughs> sober drunk, sober drunkenness, or he had many, <laughs> many paradoxes, but they all amounted to the capacity to live better with less. David Cayley, thank you so much, gentlemen. <laughs> so thank much. you both, Anish. Good night. Good night. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle, thank you. <laughs>